how do we prepare kids for the hospitalization? Um, we utilize the nursing process. Have to assess, you know, what they know, what's going to happen, how this family copes, make a diagnosis, a plan, implement it, evaluate it. And then we want to minimize separation between the, the parents and the child, um, that separation anxiety. And that's especially true for kids under five. We said that's their biggest fear, their biggest stressor in the hospital is that separation. So let's minimize it as much as we can. We do that pro by providing family-centered care. The parents are the one constant in a child's life. The nurse comes and goes, being in the hospital changes, teachers, friends, schools, neighborhood, all of those things change. What does not change is the parents stay that child's parents. So we need to remember that. The core of that, that child's world is their relationship to their parents. So parents are not visitors. They are part of that core that we're treating with the sick child. Um, the more familiar items they can bring from home, if they have their special pillow with their special pillowcase instead of the hospital pillow, their blanket, some of their toys, some of their clothes, whatever is going to help them feel the most normal, the most familiar, the most comfortable. We want to encourage that. And that's uh, we're going to try and normalize the hospital environment, partly through bringing those things from home, partly by following their routines as much as possible. It's not always possible, but if they get up and go to school in the morning at home, as long as they're able, we're going to do that in the hospital. Having structured time, and you'll see some kids, we put a schedule up on the board. You get up at 7.30, you brush your teeth, you go to the classroom, or you eat breakfast at 8, you go to the classroom at 9, you come back, you have your medicine at noon. We make a time schedule that they follow. We want them to do their own self-care. If they brush their teeth at, by themselves at home, there's no reason for mom or the nurse to do it in the hospital. They should be doing it themselves. If they get dressed themselves at home, if they bathe themselves, they should be doing it at the hospital as much as they're able. I mean, when they're truly sick. In the ICU, they're probably not going to be able to bathe themselves, but as much as they're able, they should be doing what they were doing at home. Schoolwork. If we can keep them up on school, they're already going back to school feeling different from everyone else because they've been in the hospital and they now have this scar or this, you know, just this traumatizing event they've been through that no one else has. They already have missed several weeks. They don't know what's happening. They don't know, you know, what drama has happened in the classroom while they've been gone, that's bad enough. If they come back way behind in their schoolwork, that just adds to the problems. And friends and visitors, they're used to seeing their friends every day. We're not, we don't want to discourage visitors. We want to encourage those things that are going to make the hospital feel as close to their normal life as possible. Um, this first picture this is a volunteer rocking a child. Children's has a very good volunteer program. If you have a child who doesn't have a parent or someone with them, you can call and request a volunteer. And especially if it's a baby. Oh gosh, all the volunteers who are there love to hold babies. But you can get somebody to come and play cards, play, you know, a hundred games of go fish with a school age child. It just, you know, as well. Um, and then here we have parents seeing their child and we want them to hold even if as long as the child's stable enough we want to encourage interaction and bonding between the parents and the child so we're providing nursing care for the family not just for the child which means we need to kind of assess the whole family how are they doing we need to for discharge are the parents going to be capable of whatever it is we're sending this child home with, whatever special needs, from giving medications to maybe giving tube feedings. I mean, there's a huge range of things we send kids home with. So we want parents participating in that plan of, of care, both at the hospital. Yes, we're gonna, they're not so sick that they can't go to the classroom. We're going to make that part of their daily schedule. And then also make sure that they're part of the plan for home care so that they're not 
getting sent home with something they feel totally unable to do. It takes good information, keeping the parents updated in order to do that. And then again, preparing for discharge and home care, teaching them the things they're gonna need to know, which may just be medication schedules, which may be very complicated uh, if we have a kid with some chronic illness. There are some special situations we need to talk about. Ambulatory or outpatient care. The big benefit of this is kids don't stay in the hospital. They come in, they have their procedure done, and they go home. The problem is how do you adequately prepare the child? We said child children can dream up these horrible imaginative things that are going to happen to them or that are going on inside their bodies that are nowhere near the truth. And we want to to prepare them and give them accurate information so they don't make up, you know, wild things. Uh, it's harder to do in an ambulatory setting. Um, they come, they sit, they wait. Anybody who's been in that, you know, position of sitting in a waiting room, you know that's where your anxiety really goes up. So trying to make the waiting room comfortable and minimizing the stress that uh, escalates there. And then discharge and follow up making sure those are very clear, very explicit directions. We aren't going to be able to watch them to make sure they understood and they're following the directions correctly. So make sure those discharge and follow-up instructions are clear on what we give them and we're um, taught to them clearly. Isolation. I'm telling you to keep a kid's life as normal as possible. If they're in an isolation room, that makes it really hard. They can't go to the schoolroom, they can't go to the playroom, they can't do all those things. So that is an added stressor. Um, then the child sees everybody putting on gowns and masks to come in. They now think that they have the worst illness ever, you know, seen. Again, they come up with these, you know, uh, their imagination goes wild. So make sure they understand what really is wrong with them and why we're doing the isolation, um, deal with their fears, and then the big problem is the sensory deprivation. They can't go to the playroom, they can't go to the classroom, they can't go ride a trike around the hallway. They're stuck in their room. So let's get toys from the playroom that if they're school age, the teacher has the classroom open in the morning and then goes to the isolation rooms in the afternoon. So he will come and bring them schoolwork uh, so, you know, I mean, at least they have that, but let's make sure they're not just sitting there in bed, bored, staring at a TV, dreaming up, you know, all sorts of horrible things wrong with them. Let's get them some toys. Let's get them some things they can do in the room. Uh, let's play checkers. Let's play go fish, whatever's age appropriate with them. Emergency emissions. I uh, hear the problem um, is, you know, this is an emergency. We can't really prepare them. We've got a, the admission counseling that we're going to do has to be very limited because we've got an emergency situation to deal with. So what we're, we're going to actually assess of the family and, and find out what's going on and what we're going to tell them. I think Box 2110 does a good job of listing kind of the essentials. What we may have to do rather than kind of prepare them beforehand is a postvention. We counsel with them after the event, really help um, decrease their stress, their anxiety, just the guilt they may be feeling, all those things. We have to deal with it after the event rather than trying to prevent it beforehand. And then we want to include the child and the family to participate as much as is possible and uh, appropriate intensive care unit. Um, these kids are very sick. Uh, when you go up there to Pete's ICU and NICU, you're going to see kids who we cannot reassure the parents are going to do just fine because we don't know. And that's a huge increased stress. So realize as you increase the stress, you increase the emotional needs of the family. Now's not the time to kind of push the family farther away. They need to be drawn in closer into our, our circle of who we're caring for because their needs have increased and their big need is for information. 
every little change they need to be kept informed of, um, whether those are good changes or bad changes. Because if they are bad changes, it's much better if they're getting it, you know, piece by piece by piece, rather than today my child was doing fine and tomorrow my child's on the verge of death. Uh, keep them informed that whole way and hopefully the progress is uphill instead of downhill, but either way they need to be informed. Um, kids who have been in the intensive care for any length of time where you've got a one-on-one -on -one nurse who is keeping the family informed, you know, minute by minute just about, and now the child's doing better, which is good news, and we send them off to the floor where they have a nurse, one nurse to four patients, the other three who may actually be sicker and taking up more of the nurse's time. You can imagine that the parents all of a sudden feel like their child went from being well cared for to not cared for at all. Nobody's watching. Um, so that's a, a hard step for parents. Uh, you know, they just, they felt a sense of security from the level of monitoring the child was getting. So we need to reassure them the child is better still keep them informed as we have information and changes, but reassuring them that a child doesn't need that level of monitoring anymore.